proud parent of three PHS graduates. And I also <laughs> have the honor of being the principal at Lincoln School. I am Tara O'Neill, a parent and an educator. We will do this again in a bit, but let's see who is here this evening. Give a shout out or a wave if you hear your group. Do we have uh, Prescott Unified here? Mudslinging, 
Um, there will be no attacking of opponents. We do not care what they think of each other. If our guests do engage in campaigning or attacks, we will call them out of order. We have also given them time limits for their responses. We have a lot to do tonight and we want to finish on time. Our timekeepers will be Tom Benson and Dan Kemley. Our co-chairs will keep us moving and may have to step in if one of our guests goes over the time limit. And they've been trained, they'll do it. Our decorum is important here as well. Remember that, that NAIC is nonpartisan. We do not endorse candidates. During the candidate's response time, we will listen quietly and respectfully. We do not boo our guests, nor will we applaud their answers. Instead, we want to listen for specific answers and commitments. So be listening for those specific commitments, not just vague words. At the end of all the questioning, we will collectively thank the candidates for their participation. This event is about conducting effective public business. We certainly want to model how adults can engage in civil conversation. And the back side of your agenda has a wonderful place to take notes on what each candidate answers. So let us rehearse what we are going to do. If the candidate says something we don't agree with, what are we going to do? the disruption or to have anyone disorderly removed. Just a reminder um, that no questions will be taken from the floor tonight. As much as you want to ask them, tonight is the list and only night. Excellent class we have here. Everyone should have received a comment card. Um, a commitment card, sorry. Commitment card. Can somebody hold one of those up? I'm supposed to have one and I don't. It looks like that. Awesome. Um, before we leave tonight, we will see what action steps each of us can take during this election season. You'll notice on the um, card, you've got a couple different questions asking about your level and willingness of commitment. Are you willing to organize and host? Are you willing to join the Get Out the Vote movement? Are you willing to join us in this leg legislative session during the next session? Those will be collected at the end. And just so you know, you don't get to leave unless you commit to something. <laughs> so let's look at that agenda, the white sheet you got when you came in. We will begin with a roll call of groups and institutions present. We will focus our meeting. We will then move into our education agenda and the public business with our guests. Finally, we will um, go over our call to action and adjourn at 7.30. <clears throat> so do we have a motion to adopt this agenda? Do I have a second? second? All in favor say aye. Aye. The NAIC candidate form agenda has been approved. Now let's go ahead and welcome our chair for the evening, Roberta Chamber. Raise your hand or give a shout out when you hear your group. 
point. If so, shout out now. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. We're glad you're here. We will have our focus for the evening. Good evening. My name is Ellen Radovich, and I'm a proud parent of two students in the Public Unified School District. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. This evening, we will be presenting the state of public education funding in our district public schools. Over the last several years, we've been very active in the legislative sessions. We will present our understanding of the challenges that we face as a state. We will hear information and ask specific questions of our candidates. The purpose of this forum is to bring understanding to the complex challenges that our schools are facing. We will listen to the perspectives of our candidates, and we will end with a focus on sharing this information and getting out the vote in this primary election. Because this is a nonpartisan event, we expect everyone to be respectful of one another, regardless of their point of view, even and especially if you find yourself in disagreement. Finally, this conversation is important from both a family and community perspective. Our schools, K-12, colleges and universities are starting a new academic year. Particularly at this time, we should seriously consider how we use our resources. How do we share our public resources so that all can benefit from the prosperity of our community and state? How do we ensure that we are good stewards for our future generations and for the future of Arizona? Let us now hear some stories of how our communities are impacted by this funding issue. Good evening. I am Tammy Turner, a veteran educator of 22 years and a parent of two children that have attended schools since kindergarten in the humble unified school district in Prescott Valley. My daughter graduated in 2014 and received an excellent education at Bradshaw Mountain High School. Morning. Go Bears! Thank you. <laughs> that education has helped her excel at the college level. My son is currently a junior at the same high school, taking AP classes, playing tennis around the state, and learning to broadcast school sports. I am one of the 85% of parents in the state of Arizona who have chosen a district school for my children. As a parent, I am proud to have both of my children attend district schools. We have heard about school choice and vouchers. Now is the time to hear about adequate, equitable, and sustainable funding for the schools that the majority of families choose to send their children to. As an educator, I am concerned about the lack of support for education in Arizona. Certified teacher longevity in the Humboldt Unified School District has become a challenge. Our veteran teachers that taught my daughter have been leading our school district to find teaching jobs in different states that respect and pay teachers for their expertise. The newly graduated teachers in our district are trying to learn along the way how to do their trade. And many times, once they get the experience under their belt, they move on to other places that will give them the opportunity to make a better living for their family. Over the past three years, we have hired an average of 58 teachers each year. Retaining these teachers will be critical to providing a strong educational system for our children. As a parent, I want my children to have access to the same opportunities as children in different states. As a voter, I want adequate, equitable, and sustainable funding for our district schools. As an educator, I invite you to visit Coyote Springs Elementary School. Thank you. My name is Poppy Keegan. I began volunteering at Coyote Springs Elementary School in 2008 when my oldest child began kindergarten. The ramifications of school funding cuts may not be obvious to many parents because our staff does their best to provide kids the education they deserve under any circumstance. It soon became clear to me how poor funding has impacted both the staff and the children. I would return to school each fall, expecting to see the same friendly faces that my children had come to know and love, but those changes 
Those spaces would change over the summer and sometimes even over winter break. Teachers would move to other states where education was viewed as a higher priority and they would earn higher pay, or they would change career tracks completely so that they could stay in this area. Paraprofessionals would find positions in retail, daycare, and elder care that would go farther to pay their bills. Three years ago, I took one of these open parapro positions, first as a special education aide and now as a library media specialist. My colleagues and I work with hundreds of students on a daily basis, teaching them to read, keeping them safe on the playground, tutoring them in math, and providing them with books, technological literacy, and research skills. Our children have diverse home lives, but the relationships that they build with the staff at schools can be a constant and stabilizing force. I ran into several parents over the summer who asked if I was returning over the fall. Um, unfortunately, it's not expected that staff is going to leave after the first year or two. Parapros play a vital role in their schools, yet the starting wage is below that of some fast food chains. Paraprofessionals should not have to make a choice between making a living and our love of children. Hello, thank you all for coming tonight. My name is Ellen T. I'm a parent of four children. Two are away at college and two remain here in Prescott Unified. The continued budget cuts have a financial effect on families to the extent of requested basic school supplies, well in excess of $100 per student. This not only includes normal supplies, such as loose leaf paper and pencils, but also includes reams of copy paper, hand sanitizer, tissue, composition books, etc. The list gets longer every year. In addition to the family shouldering some of the response, financial responsibility, we went to our voters for funding, which should have been provided by the state in the way of the bond and override. In addition to the lack of funds for supplies, we have gaping holes in our soft capital, capital, textbooks, computers, other technology. Our PTA has built some requests for classroom Chromebooks, which are vital not only in benchmark testing, but the extensive access the student gets to education-based applications and the ease of real-time collaboration with their peers. But the fulfillment falls short at least, by at least half, and probably more in most cases. Thank you for all listening. Now we ask you to act on behalf of our district public schools. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jeremy Plum. I'm the superintendent at Mountain Institute J10 here in Prescott. Less than a decade ago, voters in Western Yavapai County decided to form the Mountain Institute J10 to create a public school district that would serve students looking for a technical education here in our county. The J10 was designed to provide high quality instruction that would serve as a catalyst for economic development in Yavapai County and across the state of Arizona. Mountain Institute currently serves more than 1,500 eligible students from seven high schools in western Yavapai County, including homeschoolers, charter schoolers, and some students from the private school system. Over the past seven years of operation, we've outperformed our peers in nearly every statistical category. My JTEN has an extremely strong relationship with Yavapai College, with local business and industry, and has created a dynamic learning environment that has resulted in JTEN students earning over 2,000 industry certification and over 12,500 credits through Yavapai College, saving local taxpayers well over a million dollars. Recent graduates, 75% of them received industry certifications and went on to employment or post-secondary education that was in our last fiscal year, all of them ranging between 45 and some well over $100,000 in starting salary right out of high school. As you can see from the results above, business and industries look <clears throat> to JTEDs and look to relocate to Arizona because of them, and can trust that a high quality workforce is trained, certified, and ready to go to work. It is critical that we continue to build upon the solid foundation that we have begun to ensure we continue to meet the growing demands of today's labor force and ensure that Arizona is well poised to be a leader in the future economic development of the Yavapai County and Arizona. Thank you. Good evening, my name is John Amos. I'm the President and CEO of Yavapai Regional Medical Center. And tonight I wanted to share a little different perspective 
on how our Arizona schools' national reputation, and that can be either real or perceived, impacts the community from a healthcare perspective. And in my role as a, a CEO, I uh, actively participate and spend a lot of time on recruiting talent to our area, that's talent with nursing, all of our technical areas, ancillary health, and our physicians. We always do well when they come to the community. They, they see the beauty of it. Uh, we're blessed to live in this part of the country. But one of the first things that comes up are comments about what they know and hear or have read about Arizona school reputations. And at the medical center, we rely, that's our education is our lifeblood. Physicians, staff, it's a, it's a continuum that they carry. And we recognize that our strength and our support starts with our schools, our public schools. And I would like to ask the, the, the folks here, our candidates, to, to in earnest, to focus on the issue of education, the funding, the challenges. We have talented teachers. We have the best staff in, in our kids. We all know that. They go on to do great things in this country. You can pick any field and you'll find an Arizona student. But they need help. And I would just like to appeal on behalf of a healthcare perspective to please focus on funding and supporting education to make a difference so that when we bring our candidates to the community, they're proud to say they're going to be a part of the Arizona public education system. Thank you.
between our stories and the words of our state constitution. Yeah. Let us now meet our guests for tonight. Candidates, would you please introduce yourselves? We will begin in alphabetical order. You have one minute. <laughs> No. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Noel Campbell. I'm your duly elected state representative. I am from Arizona. I grew up in Maricopa County, Phoenix. I attended St. Mary's High School, Phoenix Junior College. I studied in Mexico for one year. I learned to speak very good Spanish. I graduated from Arizona State in 1965. Due to the war, I went into the Navy, became a naval officer, a pilot. I flew in Vietnam. I got out of the Navy, I went to work on the border with the U.S. Customs Service, 27 years up and down the line, and after I retired due to age, I fought fires for 10 years as a tanker pilot. I consider myself a conservative Republican, but I'm an open-minded person. Those that know me, I'm not a night anymore. I listen, I try to do the best thing I can. I'm not down there to feather my nest. I'm an independent type of person. Those who I've worked with in the education field here, they know that. I won't always agree with you, but I'm available to listen to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Mr. Davis. Hi, I'm Chip Davis. I'm a candidate for Arizona House of Representatives. My grandparents on both sides of my folks' and family went to school in Arizona. My grandparents uh, raised my my mom and dad, and they went to Arizona public schools. My sisters and I went to Arizona public schools. My wife and I, wherever I here, have four children that have been clear through Arizona public schools. And we have 10 grandchildren that are or will be in Arizona public schools. And the reason I tell you that is I have skin in this game. This isn't some failed experiment for me. I have a deep concern of the direction of the state of Arizona. And I have a deep concern of the state of education in the state of Arizona. And I believe that Arizona should be and can be producing the brightest in the world. And I'm happy to be a part of that starting January. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis, this fan. Hello, thank you all for coming tonight. What a great crowd. My name is Karen Fan. Uh, I am one of your current state legislators. I'm finishing up my third term, running for the Senate this year since my seatmate Steve Pierce has turned out. I moved to Prescott when I was four years old, so therefore I am a product of Prescott Unified School District. Um, love going here, growing up here, as well as my brothers and sisters. Um, there are so many of you out there that obviously I know, and absolutely thrilled that so many of you come down to the state capitol and talk to us about education issues and I look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Camillo. Thank you, Mr. Camillo. Thank you, Mr. Camillo. And uh, all, and can you all hear me okay? And AIC, there's an interfaith council for this uh, panel, this presentation. Y'all are the empathic ones. I mean, this is my campaign, empathy and generosity. It sounds like that's what we have in this group. And I like the other. Uh, I first came to Arizona <coughs> in 1980 to live and work at Arco Zanti, and then I subsequently worked at Cozanti down in the Paradise Valley. I came back up to the high desert uh, uh, about two years ago now, and uh, uh, I must acknowledge I never went to public school until uh, University of Texas in Austin. I went to a, a private school in Venezuela where I grew up. Um, then uh, Cho, uh, where the headmaster used to say, ask not what your school can do for you. George St. John, I mean, it wasn't original, but then we know somebody else who, who uh, uh, you know, used that, uh, that attribution. Then Rice in Houston, then UT, and I never got my bachelor's. I've given up on this notion. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Peterson. We're not supposed to sell or campaign, but good grief, you just did it for me. You took most of my notes in that presentation up there. I got involved in this. I am a candidate standing before you today because I was involved 
with the Preston Unified School District Bond Override. In that experience, and watching the primary to date, my notes, I use the same word, disconnect. There is a tremendous disconnect between what you see and what you heard up here earlier and what we are seeing and getting in our state legislature. When our state legislature comes back and expects to be paid for simply and merely restoring what they just cut the year before, there's a disconnect there. There's a terrible disconnect there. There's a disconnect in asserting that you are pro-education and pro-kids, but running on the premise and governing on the premise that our schools are somehow mismanaged and our administrators and teachers are overpaid. That is a disconnect. That is why I'm here today. I am fully committed to restoring that commitment to these things that would create and maintain thriving economies and thriving communities, including education. Thank you, Mr. Pearson. Mr. Stringer? Thank you very much for doing this and for inviting me. I am David Stringer. And uh, I am a candidate for the State House of Representatives. I see some familiar faces here. I think, I think some of you know who I am. Education is my passion. Uh, for the last few years, uh, I've been taking courses right here at Yalapai Community College in early childhood uh, development. I am currently enrolled in a master's program uh, at ASU uh, with a specialization in English English as a second language. Uh, I care about education. I understand the challenges facing public education in Arizona. Uh, and I am preparing myself in a very serious way to take part in the policy decisions that will chart the future of education in Arizona. Uh, my goal as a representative is to be the best friend that public education has ever had in Arizona. And I mean that very sincerely. I plan to be the best friend that public education has ever had in Arizona. My background, uh, I've been active. Thank you, Mr. Stringer. <laughs> Thank you, candidates. We will now present NAIC's understanding of school funding and the particular challenges facing our schools. This is what we have learned in the last four years working closely on state budget and school finances. Also, we've gained perspectives working with our legislators over the last four years. Um, and my name is Lisa Hosking. I'm an instructional coach for two of our elementary schools here in PUSD, and the proud parent of a junior at Prescott High School and a junior at Arizona State University. And my name is Dan Kelly, and I'm a community member. My name is Dr. Ernesto Todd Morales. I'm on the faculty at Prescott College and I have a nine-year-old at Abayaja Elementary School. So let's begin. We have specific questions that have surfaced through our work and research over the last few years and have created the four focus areas you see above. This presentation draws on a wide variety of bipartisan and nonpartisan sources. Much of what we are showing you today we have learned from research from experts in the field. Other sources include this list, drawing from government, nonprofit, academic, and media sources. This graph from Dennis Hoffman and Tom Rex, ASU economists, shows our tax effort in the 1970s was roughly $55 per thousand dollars of personal income. Compare that section of the graph to 2015 and we're less than $35 per thousand. Over this period of time, we've been bringing in less and less revenue into the state. This loss of revenue didn't happen overnight or by chance. Intentional decisions have been made over the course of decades by both Republican and Democratic administrations. This 
graph will help you see how our tax effort has been dramatically reduced from the 1990s. By taking property taxes out of the funding equation, whoa, too soon, right there. In the mid 90s, I mean, it was completely taken out of the funding equation for, for public education. And adding a series of income tax cuts, we've become too reliant on sales tax. Sales tax is a volatile source of revenue, especially during an economic downturn. Arizona was cutting taxes, and it was with the cyclical nature of the economy resulting in a downturn, downturn, serious cuts in turn were made. Clearly, our revenue crisis was created. Here we have another way of looking at the effect of tax cuts over the years. According to Hoffman and Rex, Arizona has taken $4 billion out of our state revenue on an annual basis. The recession created a $3 billion deficit. When the economy tanked and we were reliant on sales tax, the state needed to find $3 billion to cut. They found that money by cutting fiscal support for schools, health and human resources or services, and public safety, the three main areas that state funding supports. Arizona was not always 48th in funding education. In 1960, Arizona ranked 19th out of 50 states. In 1990, we ranked 38th. Where we really lost ground was in the 90s when Arizona didn't provide increases to schools to cover inflation. You can see what happened to school spending with tax cuts. That was really the start of a sequence of events that led to the recent lawsuit settled by Prop 123. In the last decade in particular, Spending in Arizona has not kept pace with the national average. And this has contributed to the teacher shortage we now face. This means that there are many more substitute teachers in classrooms around our state. And while substitutes provide a classroom with an adult when a teacher is absent, some substitutes or guest teachers might not have certification or may be assigned to a grade or a subject that is not their area of expertise. Arizona schools cannot thrive without investment in highly qualified educators in safe, secure, and maintained buildings with the resources students need to be prepared for the 21st century workplace. Our disinvestment in our district public schools is building a reputation across the country. Whether you agree or not with these studies, this is how we are being defined. An Education Week Research Center gave us a D plus rank 45. The Annie E. Casey Foundation's 2016 Kids Count Profile, rank 45. In this report, our children of poverty fare the worst. The Wallet Hub, Hub study of best and worst school systems reporting on 13 relevant metrics, overall rank 48, fourth worst school system in the country. Let's be clear on how far behind we are. This will help us be clear on where we need to go. We know it's not just about money. It's excellent teaching strategies, teacher preparation are all part of the, the issue. There is data that shows we could aim for a threshold. We can't dig out of the 48th hole in one year, but we could develop a strategy to begin moving in that direction. We have a study that shows a funding threshold at which school system thrives, and that's $10,200. The passage of Proposition 123 was a lifeline to our schools. However, Prop 123 did not reinstate the majority of cuts from the recession. Prop 123 was a needed first step. However, districts are still faced with wrenching choices, balancing top priorities, raising teacher and staff salaries, and funding critical classroom and infrastructure needs. Look at the bar on the left. These are the budget cuts of 2009 and 2010. The red box at the bottom only answered the inflation lawsuit. The top three boxes need to be reinstated in order for us to get back to where we were before the recession. Funding for textbooks and technology, building maintenance, and full day kinder 
are still not back in place. Study after study shows a solid pre-K program is one of the major indicator, indicators of future educational success. We are concerned about the entire spectrum, all children, pre-K to college and career. Since 2009, over 1.1 billion has been cut from K through 12. That amounts to about $1,000 per student. For our economy to grow and prosper, a highly educated and trained workforce is critical. A study by the Economic Policy Institute says and I quote, income is higher in states where the workforce is well educated and thus more productive. In turn, workers with better earnings contribute greater taxes to boost state budgets over the long run. So when will we begin to talk about revenue? Charter schools came into being about 20 plus years ago as an opportunity to create something new for education. They were designed to be laboratories of innovation. But just like traditional public schools, some schools are good to great and others are not. Isn't it time to evaluate what's been happening? Some of these schools are now independent of all rules and accountability and transparency standards that govern all district public schools. We as taxpayers provide the funding for our schools, and some charter schools have become private entities, private businesses. Your hard-earned taxes are being handed over to private individuals and private corporations with no accountability or fiscal transparency. Also, empowerment scholarship accounts have no real structure for oversight. Choice is here, but there cannot be a double standard. The Auditor General audits district spending, but not charter school spending. I'm going to say that again. The Auditor General audits district spending, but not charter school spending. The State Charter Board is the only agency responsible for the oversight of charter schools, and it also does not audit charter school spending. In 2014, the Brookings Institution did what was called a comprehensive look at Arizona's charter schools. That study concluded, and I again quote, thus far, the system of accountability in place in Arizona has not produced a charter sector that produces better outcomes on an average than the traditional sector. And we know that a great percentage of legislators are on charter boards or own charter schools. Isn't that a conflict of interest? In our community, we have a basis charter school. The study by the Grand Canyon Institute in Arizona for Charter School Accountability has provided, provided specific findings regarding basis schools. These facts are taken directly from their report. The basis schools and other for-profit charter schools spend more on administration per student, on average more than double that spent by district public schools. More funds are received per, per pupil, but fewer services are provide, provided, food services, transportation, etc. Spending is un, unaccounted for. There is no way of knowing how that money is spent because it's hidden behind a for-profit corporate firewall. And our tax dollars thus for profit become for profit and line the pockets of profiteers. A quote from the study. A clear takeaway from the study is that the state needs greater transparency from its charters and also needs to exercise greater oversight. This study of administrative costs is just one example of the areas where we know too little about how charter schools operate. <clears throat> Empowerment scholarship accounts, previously known as vouchers, fund choice, and presently are available to students with special needs, those living on reservations, and students attending schools rated D or F. However, there are several issues. Presently, as of last spring, only 2,500 of the 5,000 empowerment scholarship accounts are, that are available are currently being utilized. 
there is very little oversight. Handing over a visa card and saying good luck to the parent is not how to oversee that largest sum of money. Do students really receive a quality education? Where do they attend school? Does the Department of Education have the capacity to truly monitor even 2,500 empowerment scholarship accounts? Public tax dollars end up with private institutions. And does this create a resegregation of our schools? With all these deficiencies, the legislature wants to expand empowerment scholarship accounts at the expense of our district public schools. If we're about choice, 85% of Arizona students attend district public schools and by choice. Thank you, Lisa, Dan, and Todd for your presentation. We will now begin our questions to the candidates. We want to remind our guests and ourselves of the rules for this evening. There will be no attacking of opponents, no months there will be no campaigning. We need you to respond to the questions. And we do have time limits. We have a lot to do tonight, and we want to finish on time. We will hold our applause during the questions and then recognize all the candidates together when we have finished all the questions. Please hold your applause. Are we ready? Sonia Tenney will now lead our questions. Arizona understands that Problem 23 was an important first step. It settled the lawsuit over inflation funding for K-12, but our state's funding still lags far behind where it needs to be, and we're struggling to keep talented teachers in our classrooms. Arizona needs a comprehensive strategy to generate new revenue to move us up to a funding level that creates thriving schools and that can attract and retain teachers. Arizona needs a plan that will at least bring us back to the national average and per pupil spending. How will you use your leadership to support allocating additional revenues for district public schools in the next legislative session? You will have two minutes to respond. We'll start with Mr. Davis. Candidates, I need to remind you to please speak into the mic. Thank you. Okay. Well, the clock's ticking. Prop 301 is fixing to expire in 2021. And so um, I think that's something that we need to start thinking about right now. And for those of you that have worked on trying to expand uh, tax, tax opportunities for education, you know, it's uh, not an overnight issue, something we need to get going on. Um, we have a lot of new things coming into Arizona education, and that includes uh, the JTEC and the career and technical education roles that they're playing, uh, an additional burden on our education. Um, we have a list of needs, uh, Representative Fan, Senator, Senator Fan had asked for uh, some input from the districts within Yamapai County of what, what you would do with 2%, 5%, 10% increase in funding. And taking a look at the list from all of the district, different districts and charter schools is staggering. Uh, the amount of needs out there are just overwhelming and I do believe we have to get uh, busy addressing them. Uh, we have three big issues in the state of Arizona, healthcare, education, and corrections. And if we can start looking for efficiencies and all three of those, I believe we can come up with additional funding to go in towards education. Uh, the number of people that we're putting in through our correction system is amazing. And if we can start doing uh, innovative things with corrections, that can save money that can go towards education. Healthcare, we have uh, 6 million people in Arizona. We have 1.4 million on access. We need to do innovative things on healthcare. We can start cleaning up other parts of of state government and start doing improved efficiencies 
and that will be the resource immediately to go into the invitation. And I think one of the reasons that we are really failing to adequately address education in the state of Arizona is because you get two minutes to talk about it when you need a long time to talk about it. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Ann? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Chair Wilson. Prop 123 is just a first start, and we are working on coming up with solutions to find good, sustainable funding for the rest of um, the future of Arizona. I was fortunate, I was elected in 2011, and the part I'm fortunate about is that we were finally starting to come out of the recession a little bit. So um, uh, most of those cuts all happened before I went down there, and then as we slowly are coming out of this ditch, we are able to help um, restore some things. We had an extra, well, nothing's ever extra, but we had $600 million. And there was a group of us down there that, that really got our heels in this year and said, no, education is one of our top priorities. That meant, and yes, we did restore, that meant putting back the J-10 monies, taking $200 million um, of the rollover that was cutting our higher ed, put that back in. Um, in addition to all the other monies that we gave to the K through 12. I want to make sure everybody fully aware is aware. We have Prop 108 in Arizona. That means it is the voters, the taxpayers, that end up having to vote or need to vote to get a tax increase in Arizona. So while we can close some of the loopholes, while we can look at getting rid of some of the tax credits, some of the things that SHIP brought up, if we really truly need to um, expand our revenues in the form of some kind of bringing in additional revenues, it is the voters that are gonna have to do that. I was a huge supporter of the Prescott bond and override, and for all of you who worked on that, you knew how much work it took to get the vote out and get people to vote for that and pass it. We need to spread that encouragement and all of that throughout the state so that we can find education everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Canal. Thank you, Sonia. <clears throat> so I'd like to build on what uh, Chip and Karen said. Uh, maybe we could keep on uh, uh, building, building, building. Um, this, everybody in this room has heard of the school to prison pipeline. Corrections is a horrible blow. We, we need to end the war on drugs and get prisons for profit out of the state, um, education for profit out of the state. This farce called online education, please. This is a moneymaker for people who are not interested in education, they're interested in making money. Uh, I'd like to focus on K through 12 or pre, pre K. Um, Leave higher education to, well, I'm a proponent, advocate, practitioner of lifelong learning. We don't need the credentials. I'm so disappointed with NAWI over here in Prescott Valley. Um, I don't know if it's accredited. I attempted to go in there and I would do after a, a semester. It's like the level of eighth grade. We can do better, but let's focus on K through 12. Okay, Chip talked about the school, I mean, uh, correction. Oh, and health care, of course, that's important. But education is about half of our budget. We need to, uh, to do better, and we shall. I keep hearing, again, Karen uh, echoed, one, two, three is a first step. I'm so proud of Yampai County for voting down Prop 123 and Pima County. It was Maricopa Karen County that carried it, and, uh, you know, teachers supported it because they think it's better to something rather than nothing. We can do better. Um, what John Amos said about attracting and retaining personnel, we need education for our personnel, you know, our new hires, and their children. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cornell. Mr. Peterson. This disinvestment is at the heart of my notes refer to the same word, disconnect that we're seeing in state government, state governments these days. Under current state leadership, there is a sole emphasis on economic and community development on tax incentives, transit tax cuts to attract business, to create jobs. It doesn't work. 
uh, there's a wealth of case studies, a wealth of research showing that it ends up being a net drain on economies and attracts relatively transient uh, business entities that will just be attracted to the next state that offers something less and leads to what we saw with the revenue cuts. It's a vicious circle that leads to the revenue cuts that we're seeing. What works is being shown time and time again is investment. I use the I word and I don't apologize for that. In the community attributes, number one, always education. Education is the cornerstone for community and economic development. We saw it in the bond overrun. At the city council candidate forum in 2015, we asked this question and are asked this question so many times. What can we do to keep them here? Keep all these talented young people coming out of our colleges and high schools and universities in this area. Harry Oberman, now mayor. Bless his heart. We need to create the kind of place that they want to come and stay. That requires an investment. In the bond overriding, Preston area realtors, job my kind of contractors, uh, Yamaha Regional Medical Center, John Amos, that were our biggest supporters because they get it. These kinds of things, including education, they attract and keep talent and entrepreneurship and energy in the community to create a workforce and, and build an economy. Where does it need to come from? We need to refocus our emphasis business and economic development, not in tax cuts and tax incentives, but in genuine investment. Where does it go? Teacher salaries, number one, reduce class size, number two. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stringer. Thank you. First, let me say that, um, first let me say that I, I recognize the need for additional funding um, in education. Uh, I supported Prop 1, 2, 3. Uh, I'm the only candidate that you'll hear from tonight that not only supported Prop 1, 2, 3, I spent several thousand dollars of my own money advertising in support of Prop 1, 2, 3. As you know, it didn't pass in Yellowfly County. This was not a politically expedient thing for me to do. I did it because I thought it was the right thing to do. I supported Prop 1, 2, 3, and I supported it. I sort of put my money where my mouth was, if you will. It didn't pass in Yellowfly County, and I think that should, should suggest to you that there's a lot of opposition uh, and a lot of skepticism about putting more money into education. Um, as far as allocating additional revenues, uh, I would be frank. I think there may be an opportunity to do a little more in terms of funding for education. Uh, it'll come from increased revenues through economic growth and maybe some economies uh, in the government. But I do not believe there will be a tax increase to support public education any time in the near term uh, in Arizona. Um, but I do think there might be an opportunity to do a little. Uh, and the two areas that I would emphasize would be increasing teacher salaries. I think that's the best argument uh, that the district schools can make, uh, is that we are shortchanging our teachers in terms of compensation, that we are not competitive in our salaries. And the second area that I would emphasize is J10. I think we need to channel more children, more students, into vocational education. I think that's where their talents are, that's where their interests are. Uh, there's a lot of well-paying jobs uh, in the vocational and trades and culinary arts and so on. So that's why I would invest teacher salaries in JTEC. Thank you. Mr. Campbell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think there's anybody down in the legislature that doesn't know that education spending needs to increase. We know that. And we fought hard for it this year. Uh, as Karen mentioned, we held out, a group of us, we went against our party leadership to ensure that we got more funding. We refunded the JTEDs. We put more money into the university system. We passed Prop 1, 2, 3. That's not the issue. The issue is how do you get the revenue? With uh, the current system, the way we have to raise taxes, that's pretty much out of question. Because the voters are not going to vote to increase their taxes. There may be something I don't know here, but that's what I think. I would say this. Uh, I'm not an education expert. I don't pretend to be one. But I'm a pretty good listener. And if you've got a good argument and a good rationale, I tend to, to follow into that. And that's why I, I joined the group of 12, as we were known. So we did good work down there. You know, 
I mean, I'm, I supported Prop 123. I worked a year on it. And uh, no, it wasn't perfect. And not everybody was uh, happy, but it was a good first start. Now, I'm waiting this session for our education people. We have education experts. We have Representative Ackerman, uh, Heather Carter, in our Republican caucus. We have people that really care about education, and they're our leaders. And when you come to them and you bring your proposals, and it goes into the education uh, committee, that's where they bring us in. Because they have to bring us along just like you have to bring us along. We have to be educated. And that's how it works down here. We want to do the right thing. Uh, we're, we have a surplus. We're probably going to put it into education. We did it last year. Uh, we did really well. So that's, that's my part of leadership is learning and reasoning with it. Thank you. I'd like to take a minute to thank our timekeeper, Tom Benson, and also Dan Kenley for great work. Question number two. Our next question concerns funding for post-secondary education. Arizona has made significant cuts to universities and community colleges. Arizona has made significant cuts to universities and community colleges since the budget cutting era. College tuition has more than doubled for in-state students, limiting higher education opportunity and also increasing student debt. Georgetown University has said by 2020, 68% of new jobs in our state will require a post-secondary degree of some type, yet only 30% of our workforce has achieved this level of education. This makes it difficult to retain and recruit, recruit good paying jobs to our state. And it also makes it difficult for our children to stay in our community and find good jobs. We need to invest in a highly educated and trained workforce. What steps will you take to restore the funding to higher education at both the university and community college levels? You will have two minutes. Ms. Okay, as I mentioned before in the last question, we already just restored $200 million that has been rolled over. So that was a, a nice little start, if you will. Obviously not enough. If anybody knows anything about me and you know all the legislation I do, my number one and everything I do is all about economic development for Arizona, for growing jobs, growing our economy, because we cannot have good schools and good infrastructure or anything else if we don't have a strong economy. People working, people paying taxes and contributing to society. That's extremely important. So in answer to this question, one of the things that we, we truly need to do is we need to offer incentives. First of all, when it comes to community college and, and higher ed, we need to utilize the community colleges more and offer incentives for those that want to stay here on the level before they jump right into a four-year college. Four-year colleges are expensive. Not everybody can afford or be able to attend a fraternity. They need to work. They need to be able to participate in class before they can go on. We need to offer incentives for graduates who stay in Arizona and contribute to our economy here. Those incentives can be things like um, student loan forgiveness, reduced rates, all of these other things that we can possibly do to encourage them to stay here and help build our economy in Arizona. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kingham. Thank you. Is there any doubt where I stand on higher education? Uh, I think we need to focus on uh, K through 12. And I forgot to mention, I didn't really have time in uh, the question of one, that uh, um, this joint legislative uh, budget uh, has already predicted that uh, when we legalize adult cannabis, that's about $180 million uh, into the economy. Maybe $60 million of that will be going to uh, uh, K through 12 and other causes uh, unspecified. But uh, in Colorado, they have found uh, a great windfall. So I don't want to uh, campaign, but uh, please give us some thought. Time and time again, I hear about Prop 23 and uh, what's the second step? We haven't heard yet. And uh, it's like a repeal and replace Obamacare with what? 
Let's hear uh, some uh, real concrete uh, proposals. Now, blended regional uh, education like at Maui, baloney. You know, it's just a way of, of uh, raising revenue. We need to tax, and uh, well, we saw all these slideshows with the, the comparisons uh, over time, and the tax cuts, and ranking with other states. Uh, it's simply a question of uh, the legislature not working around the Constitution. All right? Um, the legislature is famous and adept at working around. They can do it if they want. We can do it. She said, well, Again, I want to mention uh, lifelong learning. Thank you. Mr. Pearson. In 2015, the Arizona legislature cut higher education by 14%. That's $99 million. It devastated many programs at ASU, NAU, and U of A, and all but eliminated some and a good number of our community college options. Some legislators, even Republicans, pushed back, complained that this is because of the J10 uh, issue. They voted for it because they never had a chance to read it. There's a disconnect. Senator Kelly Ward has repeatedly told students, reportedly told students that went to see her about the tuition hikes, that if you don't like it, leave. That's the problem. That is the problem. That mentality, if it's not good enough, go find some places. You know what? They do. And they will continue. That is the problem. Big brushstroke response. We need to reset our priorities. We need to look at a fair and responsible tax structure that supports community and economic development through targeted higher education offerings that tap into the economy based on ideas. The slow growth economy isn't going to happen overnight with a magic brush stroke tax cut. It means a commitment, long-term commitment to ideas and the development of ideas. A disproportionate amount of that state funding that was restored went to a number of foundation institutes at the larger universities, U of A and AMU, the Freedom Schools. I hate to buy into it. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but look it up, Google it. These are Koch brothers type machines that do little but create the rationale and the ideology and the research to support cutting education again. We need to reduce tuition, we need to reinvest in education, we need to reduce tuition and make it more accessible. I don't know how we ever reach zero tuition, but it's a nice goal, and we need to open up the programs that have been cut. Thank you, Mr. Pearson. Mr. Stringer. Thank you. I'd like to answer that question with a couple of anecdotes. Uh, as I mentioned in my introduction, I'm actually enrolled at, uh, at ASU. I'm in a master's program studying English as a second language, and uh, I've been in that program about a year and a half now. I'm about 60% percent Um in 2014, uh, the legislature did cut education like $99 million. Uh, I got an email uh, in 2015, actually they had early 16, from the Mary Lou Fulton College of Education at the uh, Arizona uh, State University, telling me that the Mary Lou Fulton College of Education had moved over the past year, had moved from a ranking of 17 nationally, and had moved up to 14 nationally. And this, of course, is the year after they just cut $99 million in the budget. So my point is, where is the correlation between spending and the ranking of our university or the quality of the education produced by our university? It sure as hell didn't hurt the American Fulton College of Education. The second anecdote is Grand Canyon University. I had a chance to visit down there recently. Grand Canyon University is a private, for-profit, Christian school, fully accredited, has 17,000 students on campus, 60,000 uh, online. Their average tuition is lower than ASU or any state university. Their average tuition is lower. This is a for-profit university that pays taxes, doesn't consume taxes. So this is something you guys need to think about because you know what? The legislature knows that. The legislature knows that. So you need to think that uh, when you talk about funding higher education, you need to learn, you need to understand the facts and what's going on in education. That private education is doing it better and cheaper. Thank you. 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 Thank
différent. So, I'll try to answer the question, which is, you know, what, what did I do uh, this year down there? Well, I think uh, I did quite a bit. Um, we, we took the state surplus and we put it into higher education. We paid off the rollover debt of $200 million to, to higher education. We funded the JTEDs fully. And, you know, we had a limited amount of money to deal with. Plus, we passed Prop 123, which I will remind you, puts $3.5 billion into K-12 education over the next 10 years. Is that enough? Probably not. But it's a good start. And you know what? You'd have to be in the legislature. I, I'm just a citizen like you. If you had to go down there and work and try to do, deal, deal with these issues, you would come to the realization that nobody gets anything or all the time what they want. So you try to make incremental progress, and you do that. President Michael Crow from Arizona State University comes down to the legislature religiously when we're in session. He comes out every two weeks. He has a lunch that he throws for us, and we go in there, and he talks about the needs of the university system in this state. And that's what it takes, because I went to those first meetings a little skeptical, but I came out realizing that the value of our university system. And so we put more money back into the university system. We put money into Arizona, University of Arizona for a veterinarian school, which the rural areas set, uh, desperately need. We need large animal vets out here, and hopefully we're going to accomplish that with the veterinarian schools at the University of Arizona. So um, give us a little credit. You know, I mean, we, we did a good job down there. Remember, we have to have a balanced budget. We can't just create money out of the air like the federal government. Thank you, Mr. Davis. So in the 1970s, uh, the state of Arizona, 70% of the general fund went towards education. In the 15-16 budget, we're at 52%. So in my lifetime, that's the difference in the investment in education I've seen in the state of Arizona. And that goes from K-12 up to, through secondary. Uh, Arizona was predominantly in shot for a 50-50 tuition rate, where it was 50% covered by the state, 50% covered by the student. Uh, what they've done in the shortfall, they didn't just sweep it under the rug, they went to the out-of-state students, and that is uh, who's making up the difference now. But the selling point that we need to do, and I can't go whether it's K through 12 or secondary, is we need to tie in the term investment. And if we start proving that an investment in our education system actually attracts industry, it attracts manufacturing, it causes people to come here. Arizona is a leader in the biosciences industry throughout the world. Arizona is a leader. So I think the compelling argument that we need to make as a state whether it's to pass an initiative through our citizens through a referendum, or whether it's legislative action, is we need to prove on paper, scientifically, how the investment will return back to the community. And that's what our tour is going to be. Thank you. For now, school choice is a given. <coughs> However, it should not come at the expense of the district public schools which are the choice of 85% of all students in Arizona. There needs to be a level playing field with maximum transparency and accountability for our tax dollars. If our district public schools must account for every dollar, so must public charter schools. As our elected representative, how will you work with the Arizona Department of Education to align the fiscal accountability and reporting system for public charter schools to the one currently in place for district public schools? And will you oppose the further expansion of empowerment scholarship accounts during your next term of office? Mr. Canal. So, <coughs> fiscal accountability and reporting and uh, things like uh, teachers, um, backgrounds, uh, 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 their, their certification, 
uh, all of the, these charter schools really need to come up to the level. Well, we saw, we saw this uh, uh, on the slide, the, the same level of uh, accountability and uh, uh, regulating as the district schools. Uh, it's like, uh, I'm pretty sure to the choir. I can't remember if it was Todd Morales over here who reminded us that uh, we have codes and uh, we, with this undereducation, which is uh, um, an epidemic, uh, it's a uh, uh, it's happening all over the country, not just in Arizona. Uh, this underfunding, the uh, um, um, resegregating of our public schools. One of the code words is states' rights. When you hear that, you can be sure that means uh, it, it came from the redemption after Reconstruction uh, uh, two, two centuries ago. It, it means uh, segregation. All right, so work with the uh, the Department of Education uh, is uh, a given. Even somebody like Diane Douglas has good ideas. We need to use imagination. Things like uh, the uh, legalizing cannabis is just one one little uh, a drop in the bucket. I mean, uh, let's uh, cooperate with people like Diane Douglas, who is elected, you know, in a position of, of effective change. Uh, so. The second part, empowerment, scholarship, county essays, vouchers, absolutely not. Come on, please. Thank you. Mr. Pearson. I was challenged in a recent uh, campaign event by somebody who's involved in church schools. That I guess I will say the same thing. She said, I don't want this to become a charter school versus public school issue. But the reality is, we do need to acknowledge that we need to have a level playing field. Uh, one of our current city council people, Billy Orr, was one of our biggest supporters of the bond override for all the right reasons, not simply because if it doesn't happen here, it's not going to happen because it's not coming from the state. Uh, she repeated the same thing. We need to have choice, but not the expense of a public education system. Church will serve as an advantage. They are, they do get public money, but it's from a different fund, it's from the general fund. They, uh, where our local school districts have to go out and get local taxes and end up competing in the things like the bond override, like with organizations like the Citizens Tax Committee, which mount just vehement opposition to any funding proposals. They start out at a disadvantage. We don't have a level playing field. Step one is we have to acknowledge that. We don't have a level playing field. An example, the last 100-day numbers, uh, basis, which I work with, they put out a wonderful product, but last 100-day numbers, enrollment of 709, 16 of special ed, that's 2%. Plus the unified school district, enrollment 3826, and it's up. Way to go, guys. Uh, 621 special ed, that's 16%. We need to have a level playing field that starts with using the same accountability standards and mechanisms that are already in place for the public school system. The ESAs, something any Tea Party conservative should get their hand around, giving money to families to fund their students' education any way they want with little accountability, absolutely not. We need to have accountability, and we need to have mechanisms in place to mitigate the loss of revenue if, uh, that incurs the public school system. Thank you. Mr. Singh. Thank you very much. I'm going to pay you the respect of telling you the truth about what you can expect from the next legislative session and probably the next several legislative sessions. With respect to um, charter schools, uh, I support a level playing field. Um, I support fiscal accountability and transparency. Uh, one of the things I didn't get a chance to mention in my introductory remarks is that my training is as an attorney and a CPA. Uh, nobody believes stronger in accountability and transparency than a CPA. But charter schools were initiated to provide for innovation uh, in education because the traditional district schools were not providing that innovation, all right? So that's why we went to charter schools. And they've been, as a general matter, quite successful. There obviously have been failures, but they haven't many of them been, been successful. I was surprised here when they did the introductory remarks that nobody from Basis was introduced. Did I get that right? Nobody from Basis, nobody from Tri-City Prep, nobody from the Agricultural and uh, Equine Center in uh, 
in PD, and these are, these are some of the strongest public schools, they're all public schools, these are some of the strongest public schools in our county, they're not represented here today. I want to talk for a minute about the ESA account, because the ESA account is the future. Our governor supports it, the legislative leadership, uh, next session will support it, you can expect to see expansion in empowerment uh, education accounts, whether you like it or not. So what you need to do is try to deal with the next legislature and try to protect your career interests because they're coming. It is the future of education in the state of Arizona. It may take a couple of decades to play out, but that will be the future of education. As a legislature, I will try to make sure this is done incrementally and that your professional and career interests are protected. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. You know, um, I support accountability and I, and I the concept of accountability and transparency. But we have to see these bills come up through the legislature and we don't see them. Uh, and that has to do with the politics of it. But uh, I'm sort of a maverick down there if, and I believe in a level playing field. But I've got to see the legislation first. And, uh, you know, I, I'm the first one to tell you I, I believe in school choice. I believe in whatever works in education, homeschooling, parochial education. I'm a graduate of a parochial high school, and I, I didn't do that, Dad. So I support uh, those, those types of education that turn out good citizens. So as to the charter school issue, yeah, put your pressure on getting these bills to the right committees so that we can look at them. It's one thing to talk about them here, but it doesn't do anything down there if we never see the bill. Right? So you've got to use your political power and you've got to use your persuasion to get your goal. And I think most of you know what I'm talking about. Now as to ESAs. That's going to be the biggest dog fight you've ever seen next session. It's coming down the track. I'm telling you. So where do I stand on ESAs? First of all, I don't think that ESAs are a threat to public school schools. I don't because the ESAs require parental involvement to take that kid out of school, to put him into a private school, to pay the difference in education. Only about 15 to 20 percent of the parents are going to do that with their children. So I don't think there's a danger to public schools, but I could be wrong. But I will say this, I have a real issue with the accountability problem, taking, which is taxpayer money out of the general fund and giving it to parents that's not accounted, not accounted for. That is a constitutional issue. I've got to weigh that very carefully versus the concept of parental choice. I don't know where I come down on that yet. I want to see how many ESAs they're proposing next year. We can't even fill the 5,000 that are allotted. Only 2,500 of them have been used. So let's see where we are on it next year and stay in touch with us. Mr. Davis. Actually, ESAs impacted Arizona's general fund budget $40 million this past year. And this particular question is the key to where the direction of the state of Arizona has got to go right now. The process that I've witnessed dealing with the legislature from my end is that oftentimes numbers are just thought of. There's no rhyme or reason or science or research to how the numbers are, are come to. And so in my quest to understand education in the state of Arizona and researching different education models throughout the country, my head spins and I just can't understand all of these different models and I come to the conclusion, A, I believe the Arizona legislature doesn't need to understand education to the nth degree. The Arizona legislature needs to provide the resource so the people that know what the heck are going on in education can get the job done. So that made my life a lot simpler. Okay, my job is going to be to provide the resource. You all are to provide the education. I take a look at public schools, private schools, charter schools, public charter schools. Makes right no reason how they're funded. We'll put a number over here for public schools. We'll put a number over here that will fund charter schools. Why do you have that number? It doesn't make sense because the public school has more of a community resource for the entire community versus the charter school, who's generally in a private building and the rent is paid to a private owner, so the asset never belongs to the public, like the traditional public schools. 
Um, I take a look at our ability to donate to our schools. I can go down and donate to our local high school. I can give them 400 bucks. But I have to dedicate the program that that's going to go to, the auto mechanics and the band. But I can go down to the private school that our grandkids go to, and I can give a thousand bucks, and they can apply it anywhere they want to. So I believe establishing equal standards, equal criteria across the board, just by our numbers, is what we have to do. Once we do that, we're going to find money in the right places. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Ms. Ham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first and foremost, I think that our Arizona education funding program needs to be totally trashed and rewritten. Uh, it is trying to get your head around how we fund education in Arizona is just mind-boggling. It's worse than the IRS code. So I think that's something we need to address right off the bat. I do believe that we should have an even playing field, not only between our public schools, charter schools, whether it's district charter, private charter, but I think everybody needs to be playing on the same equal playing field. That's important. You don't get to do a program and have a different set of rules for everybody in the program. So that is the next priority that needs to be taken care of. I also believe that part of that is creating less regulation. When we make them equal, when we make them accountable, I want to make sure that we aren't adding a bunch of unnecessary, more bureaucracy and more regulation. Right now, our public schools are so overburdened, we have so much paperwork that the teachers have to do, the administrators have to do, I would like to see us be able to reduce a lot of that. So instead of raising the regulation on everybody else, part of that I want to see lower the regulation on public schools. Um, with respect to the ESAs, I do support ESAs. I support all education, whether it's public, private, charter, whatever. We are so blessed here in Yakima County to have amazing schools, amazing teachers. That's not true necessarily in Phoenix or Tucson. When you have a a family, a parent, who is in an oppressed neighborhood and their child is forced to go to an F-rated school that is unsafe, I say that parent should have the right and the ability to take their tax dollars that they have paid in on their property taxes, which is what it is, they should be able to take that money and send their kids to a, a good school, an A school, and a safe school. Thank you, Mrs. Sam. Ms. Sam. Okay. First of all, a final two-part question, a yes-no question. Um, will you meet with us after the August 30, 30th primary election? And if elected in November, will you meet with us on a regular basis, both here and at the Capitol, regarding these critical issues? Mr. Pearson? Yes. Thank you for your yes. Mr. Stringer? Yes. Thank you for your yes. Mr. Campbell? Um, it, they pay us the big bucks to meet with you folks, so I'm happy to do it, even though you don't agree with me half the time on a lot of issues. But I've got thick skin, and I'm here to serve you, and I certainly will never dodge you, and I'll be available. Thank you, Mr. Long. Campbell. Thank you for your yes. Mr. Davis? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your yes. Ms. Stan? Yes. Thank you for your yes. Mr. Kinnar? Yes. Thank you for your yes. Okay, we will now have a closing remarks. Of course we all say yes. <laughs> this is wonderfully put together. Yes, we will, of course. But that's empty unless it's accompanied by a genuine commitment to refocus our priorities in investing in public education as a cornerstone for community and economic development. I've had the opportunity of luxury running out of voters in the primary to pay attention and pay close attention to some of the things that I have heard. One of the questions that comes up repeatedly in campaign events is whether or not candidates support abolishing the state income tax. And one of the responses I heard was given the changing state demographics, we need to do all we can to keep the state attractive for retirees who tend to vote conservative and vote Republican. And I'm challenged by another one of the candidates, and I know I'm not supposed to campaign the next year. Uh, for doing that. Uh, the response was it doesn't matter. That it's devastating for the state economy, it doesn't matter because we need to do all we can to keep the state ready. 
That was the day I decided to run. I've been an independent. I decided to run as a Democrat. And one of my biggest supporters that pushed me and encouraged me to run looked at me that day and said, I'm tired of all this talk about keeping the state red or turning it blue. Let's make it purple. <laughs> you got to get choked up here. Thank you for pushing me like that. I appreciate it. Thank you. I want to return in my closing remarks here to the empowerment scholarship accounts because this really is the elephant in the room. Um, I just I don't think that the district school, the government school uh, people, folks who support that, really understand the demographics of our state and what is what is what is pushing this agenda. Uh, there is tremendous support for the empowerment scholarships account at the state house. And that's because so many of our schools around the state are really struggling. We don't see that here in Alpine County. We don't see that as much in rural Arizona. We've got great schools. By the way, the PSUD, uh, Preston Unified School District, has some of the best schools in the state, and their average spending is actually a couple thousand dollars lower. So you can't really make this correlation between spending and student outcomes. And by the way, the focus seems to be student outcomes, not funding. Everybody wants to talk about how much we're spending on education. Why does anybody talk about what, what are we getting for our money and where do we rank in terms, with other states in terms of in terms of student achievement? We actually rank much higher than 48. Nothing to brag about, but much higher than 48. So the reason I think that uh, I can help you folks is because I'm going to have influence. I'm going to have influence with the conservative majority that runs our state house. If I get elected, I'm very likely to make promises. I don't just listen to what I'm saying. But I think it's highly likely because of my background, I'll be on the education committee and I'll be influencing policy and I'll be in a position to help you as nobody else. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for all sitting here and listening to us. And I know it's trying at times. All I can tell you is uh, my philosophy is of goodwill to listen. I'm not the expert. I have to listen to you folks. Those that have dealt with me know I have a pretty much open door down there. If you come to the legislature and you want to talk to me, I'll bring you in my office. And even if you come unannounced, uh, I pretty much operate that way. Um, I want to do the right thing for our public schools. I want to do the right thing for all of our students. Um, I have my own ideas, uh, but I want to see the proposals that will actually be presented to us. Well, we can talk forever about these issues, but when you get down to it, it has to be put into writing. It has to be, become a bill. Somebody's got to sponsor that bill, so then we can deal with it, okay? So if we don't get those bills to us, there's nothing we can do. So you have to make your voice heard with the education committee. I'm not on the education committee, and they don't call me in when these bills come in. But once that gets out of committee is where we get involved. And so at that point, uh, I will be uh, hopefully a true representative for you and look at every issue fairly. I'm certainly not in it to feather anybody's nest, charter schools or parochial schools or any of that stuff. I want to make sure we get the best bang for the buck and get the best student outcomes that we can. And with that, I thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Am I proud of Arizona? Yes. It would be a bald-faced lie if I said that I was proud that Arizona is 49th in education funding. And that is something that uh, I believe we have to fix. We don't, we can't kick the can down the road any longer. Um, and I'll go back to my previous comments, is that there is a lot of loose change in the cushy booty couch right now. And when you look at the funding formula, and the criteria of all of these different school proposals, I believe we can come up with something that's fair and equitable. But the, the challenge you have is, A, again, 1979, we were at 70% general fund funding for education. 2015-16, we're at 52%. There's a huge challenge, that the percentage of general fund funding going into education is shrinking as a percentage. While at the same time, we have competition coming from now. Public charter schools, private charter schools, and private schools 
to take funding from that only only resource. And so we've got big challenges ahead, and I'm excited to tackle them and move forward. And again, Arizona's going to have a bright future. We have to because our kids and grandkids are going to stay here. Thank you, Ms. Sandy. Sure, take my words, Jim. Arizona is a great state, and I am very, very proud that this is my home state. We do have a lot of challenges, not just in our education and education funding, but infrastructure, our corrections department. We have a lot of things on our plate right now that we need to take care of. Education is one of those at the very big top. And we have to make sure that we adequately fund education. We adequately make sure that our kids graduate from high school and from college with a way to go and get a job and provide the, I hate it when he does that thing, <laughs> and try to provide them with the skills for a good job. I am hopeful that as a team we can all work together, that we can all help each other. As I travel around and visit a lot of the schools, I was in Baghdad Tuesday, one of the other things that I was told was the fact that we have to get parents more engaged. Teachers tell me that they have a difficult time teaching students when the students aren't even there for school because the parents couldn't get up out of bed to get their children to school. So I think this is more than just education. I think this is also about we need to work more and together as a community, as parents, as people who care, and let's start engaging some of the parents that haven't been engaged and that will help us all be better in the long run. Thank you, Mr. Connell. Thank you to the NAIC. This is such a terrific uh, uh, event. Thank you all for, for coming, and uh, we do have our work cut out for us. <clears throat> now, uh, Karen reminded me uh, this bit about uh, geography and you know where we have our loyalty. Although I've moved around a lot, uh, um, I've spent most of my life in Arizona. And I moved to India, in fact, during Reagan's dirty wars against uh, Latin America, to settle. And I, I had the wrong visa to, so by go, to go by foot. I came back to the U.S. to get a visa, and I realized when I made landfall, this is where I was born, this is my birthright. And so I'm taking a stand to make things better. We, everybody can change, and this is in, investment, which is sort of the the theme that uh, is a shocking uh, notion, but we're shocked every time we hear about it. Uh, it can be turned around, it can be flipped in, an instant, in the blink of an eye. So, uh, speaking of uh, changing the Constitution, which we can do, 30 seconds to go. All right, everything is in flux. Uh, future focus, besides lifelong learning, is the third time I'm mentioning that. You know, uh, this is uh, pretty important. I'm the conservative in this race. So, uh, in changing the Constitution, <laughs> students of both sexes, please, we have to recognize we can't have a bathroom bill, you know, not work around that, you know, take the labels off of the bathrooms if we have to, to acknowledge and uh, take advantage of uh, the, this new vitality that comes from our, our youth. 16 year olds who have the vote. And we should listen to them, not just our educators and our fellow legislators. Thank you, thank you. And reform is not a dirty word. I agree with Joel. Thank you very much.
So if you would please stand, stretch those legs, and listen to this little bit of information before you leave. We've conducted important public business here tonight. We've learned the history of disinvestment in education in Arizona. We've seen how tax cuts have moved Arizona to the bottom in terms of school funding. We've explored how the privatization of charter schools has targeted public dollars, has established, and it's established a double standard. We've heard from our candidates on how they will address these critical issues. We've heard some good commitments and candidates. We will look forward to working with you after the elections. We plan to continue meeting with you both here and at the legislature, right everybody? Yes. Our commitment and our involvement is what makes the difference. We face important challenges in the state, and just as the candidates are working hard on their campaigns, we need to work hard to make education an important issue for voters. Right, everybody? Yes. That's democracy in action. Please look over the commitment card that you received and let us know how you can be involved this fall. Can you host a meeting to let others know about the vote? Will you work to get out the vote for these important elections? Would you be willing to work on this issue even after the election, even travel to the legislature? Let us know how you can be involved on that card. We have floor team members who will collect all commitment cards so that we can be in touch with you about our next steps. Thank you, everyone. And at NAIC, we are adjourned. <laughs>